The title of this panel is Understanding and Overcoming Gaps in Measurement, Modeling, and Regulation to Implement Meaningful Climate Policy. And the purpose of the panel is several fold. First, it's to highlight the need for and the role of air quality measurements and modeling in informing climate policy. The panel is also about considering existing and potential air quality regulations that can be used to implement climate policies in the US and particularly at the federal level using the Clean Air Act. And then finally, the panel is designed to consider how the public perceives both climate science and policy and ways in which the public can be mobilized to support continued efforts and regulations. So we have three excellent panelists uh, today. The first one is Trudy Strelvmo, who's an assistant professor in geology and geophysics here at Yale. Our second panelist will be Dan Lashoff, who's the director of the Climate and Clean Air Program at the Natural Resource Defense Council. And then our final panelist will be Cliff Davidson, who's the Thomas C. and Colleen L. Wilmot Professor of Engineering at Syracuse University. So we're going to have each of them give a presentation of about 15 minutes, um, I'll, and I'll introduce them more formally as they come up. And then at the end, we're going to have a sort of a question and answer session. Um, we're a small group here, so I think it can be very conversational. So our first speaker is going to be Professor Strelvmo, who I mentioned is an assistant professor in geology and geophysics here at Yale. She's an atmospheric scientist and joined the Yale faculty in 2010 after completing postdoctoral research at both ETH Zurich and the University of Oslo. Her research uses climate models, often combined with remote sensing and in situ and laboratory experiments, to better understand how aerosol particles influence regional and global climate, in particular via their effects on clouds. Professor Strelvmo received her Bachelor of Science in Physics from the University of Oslo, her Master of Science in Meteorology from the University of Washington in, in Seattle, and then her PhD in Atmospheric Science also from the University of Oslo. So Professor Strelvmo, if you want to come up and give your presentation. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, thank you all for coming out in the snow. Um, like Bruce said, I think we're um, a small enough group that we can make this fairly interactive. And, and I only have a few slides. And I, I think if you have questions along the way, um, you, you may interrupt and, and go ahead and ask. Um, so I wanted to talk about aerosols and climate, which is really what my group works on here at Yale. Uh, and I wanted to address three issues, or address three questions. Um, one, uh, how, what are the contributions of aerosols uh, and greenhouse gases in climate change? Uh, how well do we understand those contributions? And I also want to talk about the role of black carbon in particular. Black carbon has received a lot of attention uh, recently uh, as uh, potential to um, uh, both improve air quality and uh, cool our climate. So that's an interesting topic, topic in this context. And then uh, end with talking about what the climate effect of cleaning the air could be. So the picture here is a nice example of uh, how aerosol pollution clearly has an effect on both air quality in urban areas uh, particularly, and also it's clear that such a brown haze layer will have an effect on the energy balance of the surface and that it will affect the amount of sunlight that reaches the surface. So um, I'm going to talk about, uh, start by talking about the climate effect of aerosols in relation to greenhouse gases. And this figure, some of you have probably seen many, many times before, and I think some of the speakers yesterday showed it as well. Uh, so it's the forcing chart from the last IPCC report, which essentially shows what the, the key drivers of climate change have been since pre-industrial times. So any bar here with a warm color represents a warming, so you can recognize all the well-known greenhouse gases at the top there uh, have a warming effect. And then further down, you can recognize the Aerosol, dry, aerosol effects on climate, so how uh, the aerosols tend to compensate for some of the warming effects that the greenhouse gases have. Uh, what you also see from this, this chart is that there's a fairly large uncertainty associated with the aerosol driver or the aerosol forcing of climate change. And unfortunately, despite the fact that we have you know, a growing community of people 
of scientists working on this problem of what aerosols, uh, how, how aerosols affect our climate, th those air, air bars haven't really, or those uncertainty bars haven't really been reduced uh, over the last couple of decades. And, and so that's uh, a problem for several different reasons. At the bottom there is the, not, the net driving force of climate change, and you can see that the uncertainty bar from the aerosol forcings propagates into the net forcing, and meaning we don't have a very good understanding of the net, what the net driving force of climate change has been um, in the past. And also as we think about improving air quality and reducing uh, aerosol concentrations in the atmosphere, it also means that we don't have a very good understanding of what that would do to our climate. And so why do we have these huge uncertainty bars or, or air bars associated with the aerosol effect on climate? Well, I, most of my work, as Bruce said, uh, deals with modeling aerosol effects on climate. And it's a tremendous challenge to represent these processes in climate models that have a resolution of, of you know, on the order of 100 kilometers. So what, what this slide shows is just the range of different sources that emit aerosols to our atmosphere. So again, you recognize the picture of urban pollution on the upper, upper left-hand side. We also have natural aerosols that are emitted from deserts, from sea spray, and so on, that mix with the anthropogenic aerosol particles. And we have a range of different uh, anthropogenic aerosol sources that all emit aerosols with somewhat different composition. And then what that, that picture in the middle shows is uh, how, how aeros different aerosol species also mix in the atmosphere and that affects their properties uh, in compl complex ways and also how they influence climate. <clears throat> So that makes this, this problem of representing aerosols in climate models a very challenging one. Now, in the previous chart that I showed you from IPCC, uh, you saw that all the aerosol, different aerosol species were lumped together in one forcing bar, and we saw that that was a net f cooling effect that all, all aerosol particles combined have on our climate. But we, you probably, uh, most of you know well that different types of aerosols affect our climate differently. So um, on the upper left hand side here now is an il illustration or a schematic of how some aerosols are very efficient scatterers of solar radiation and reflect more sunlight back to space and they have the traditional cooling effect that we know. But then other aer aerosol species, species and especially black carbon absorb sunlight and, and I've illustrated that on the right-hand side here from a modeling study uh, where you see the, anything in blue here represents a cooling, uh, a negative forcing, uh, and anything in red represents a positive forcing and hence a warming. So you have the warming effect of black carbon on the upper right-hand side and the cooling effect of sulfate on the lower right-hand side. And as we think about cleaning the air, uh, and what that will do to our climate, we have to think about these competing effects and also the problem that these different species are often co-emitted from a lot of sectors. And also, um, there's this additional effect that aerosols can have by affecting clouds. So if they're uh, somewhat soluble in water, they have the ability to form cloud droplets on them and that has the effect of brightening clouds and that's also a cooling and sulfate particles are efficient at doing that. Black carbon particles, not so much, unless they're mixed and age in the atmosphere, in case the, the, the story becomes a little more complicated. Judy, I just have a quick question. Yeah. So in looking at your two charts, it's really striking that the areas where you get the most amount of cooling overlap with the areas that you get the most amount of warming. And so I was wondering if there's been any research done that shows a sweet spot of a balance between sulfates and black carbon um, in terms of the levels of the concentrations so that policymakers could know how to keep these two elements in balance. Yeah, you know, sulfate and black carbon is often um, co-emitted, and that's why you, you often see the, the maximum warming and maximum cooling coinciding. But in terms of, you know, an optimization of, you know, what, <laughs> what the optimal emission of black carbon to, to sulfate would be for both air quality and climate, I don't think anyone has done 
that study. But certainly, um, as perhaps as I move on to my next slide here, uh, you know, this study just came out, and I'm uh, the 19th author, I think, on this <laughs> in, on this paper. Uh, it was a major collaboration, uh, and it made quite a splash. The study, when it came out, uh, got a lot of attention in the media. Uh, and so what I'm showing here is now a similar forcing chart to what uh, we had from the IPCC, but now we're only looking at the different black carbon effects on climate. And so what was so interesting about this study, uh, or what the media thought was interesting about this study, was that we came up with a much stronger warming effect from black carbon than what, for example, IPCC had come up with. And part of that was um, ca factoring in that uh, we have, have probably in our climate modeling studies and, and chemical transport modeling, we've been underestimating uh, sources or emissions in certain parts of the world. So um, we came up with a warming that is now only, only second to CO2, so, so this uh, study makes black carbon the second most important driver of climate uh, change or, or global warming after CO2. So, so that was very interesting. But again, there are some, some caveats. You know, people get excited because if you, this means that there would be a tremendous climate uh, benefit from reducing black carbon in addition to the air quality benefit that you would have from it. But of course, there are a number of caveats, uh, and you can see that the second group of forcings there um, represents how uh, these black carbon particles interact with clouds. And there's uh, you know, very large and certainly uh, or error bars associated with each of these contributions. So unfortunately, then at the bottom here, where you have the total climate forcing from black carbon only, you have this very strong warming of 1.1 watts per square meter. So that's, that's almost as strong a warming as CO2 has, but there's also this very wide uncertainty bar, unfortunately. Uh, that propagates from each of the different uh, mechanisms through, black uh, through which black carbon can influence climate, but it adds up to a very wide uncertainty range in, in our best estimate. And then the bottom bar there, you can see, is slightly negative, and that's black carbon and all its co-emitted species. Uh, and that's factoring in black carbon rich sources only. So there again, uh, you get this uh, competing effect of the warming black carbon and the cooling sulfate. And if you simply went for reducing black carbon rich sources only, you would actually risk to contribute somewhat to, to global warming. Uh, you would of course have also the benefit of cleaning the air, but in terms of the climate, there's, uh, there's no benefit you know, according to according to that, that lower um, bar. But again, very wide uncertainty ranges. Does that include organic carbon as well? Yes, uh, everything that is co-emitted, sulfate, organic carbon, anything that is co-emitted from carbon-rich sources, so that's essentially um, biomass burning and diesel fuel burning. From black carbon? Um, yeah, from all these species, if you have to take care of them all at the same time for an air quality, from an air quality perspective, or for that policy mm. objective, then the impact on climate, I mean, we have huge uncertainty, but isn't expected to be very... Exactly, different. exactly. Uh, you can, there are certain sectors that you could target that are uh, where the majority of the emissions are uh, black carbon. So those would be the, the obvious ones to target and try to reduce. But, but you always have to be aware of, of the co-emitted species and what they do. So a so, um, uh, bit of a challenge there, in, both in terms of uh, understanding some of the, uh, of the mechanisms through which black carbon influence our climate and also uh, the competing effect of black carbon and its, its co-emitted species. So uh, finally, just looking at uh, reducing uh, aerosol concentrations in general in the atmosphere, uh, because in the long run, we may not, for air quality purposes, we may not only want to reduce black carbon, we may, may want to reduce 
uh, aerosols in general for, for health benefits. And so what I'm showing here is actually uh, recent work from my group where we've tried to decompose the temperature trend of the last, well, the last 40 years of the last century. And so the red uh, curve here represents the warming that we would have had if we didn't have this masking effect, this compensating effect from aerosols, uh, which in, in, in the total is, is a cooling that, that compensates for some of the greenhouse warming. Uh, and, and, that, um, and that effect of the aerosols, that, that cooling effect of the aerosols alone is in the, in the green bar there. And then the, the blue or the, the, the purple lines here represent what we, the, the warming that we've actually seen. So this was a statistical analysis uh, using observations. So there's no climate modeling involved here for those of you who are skeptical, skeptical about climate modeling results, perhaps rightly so. So um, a, a point that I wanted to make with this figure is also that um, we, have, we have already been cleaning our air uh, not, and not targeting selective, selectively black carbon. And some of the accelerated warming that we saw in the, uh, you know, at the end of, of the last century was probably uh, partly caused by us cleaning the air. And so um, this, this is important to keep in mind as we think about air quality and, and the fact that um, as we reduce not, not only black carbon but also other aerosol species, it may uh, contribute to accelerating global warming. So we, we need to think carefully about what sectors we want to target if we don't want to have this um, acceleration of global warming as a, an unintended consequence of cleaning our air. Yeah. Relatively constant. Now, do you, do you have a sense uh, if we went forward another 10 years, does the massive growth in China change that picture? Does, uh, hmm. is, is it, would it be going down again? That's or is the sort of reduction cleaning up in the rest of the world for compensating for the growth in China? Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent question, and I think um, de depending on you know different regions of the world, you you'll have different trajectories in terms of aerosol concentrations, and also what we used here was actually we had uh, surface stations of the of amount of radiation, solar radiation that reached the ground, and that was went into this statistical analysis, and so there there was this stabilization. Uh, if you, know, if you looked at all the stations that we had, there was the stabilization at the end of last century. But certainly in China, uh, there wouldn't have been stabilization. There would, would have been a steady reduction in the amount of sunlight that reaches the surface because of increased air pollution. So um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have a whole lot of stations in China. They're, most of them are in Japan. So, so our Asian stations are in Japan, which isn't necessarily representative of what's going on in China or India. I think I've gone way over time already. Uh, is that right? <laughs> um, I think that I'll skip the, this slide and just move on to my, my food for, for thought here. Um, so uh, I started out with saying that the, the aerosol forcing in total, if you just lump all aerosols together, is compar probably comparable in magnitude to uh, the total greenhouse forcing, but of opposite sign. So it has been masking a lot of the warming uh, we would otherwise have seen from greenhouse gases. Uh, but as we, we know very well, different aerosol species affect climate differently. And if we could isolate black carbon and reduce black carbon emissions in particular, uh, that, would, that would have a, a very uh, beneficial effect to our climate as well as air quality. Uh, Unfortunately, there are aspects of black carbon effects on, on climate that we don't understand very well. And there's also the, the caveat of co-emitted species that may not give us the, the wanted climate effect if we reduced carbon, uh, black carbon-rich emission uh, sources. Um, so uh, there is the risk as we uh, attempt to improve air quality that we are going to uh, accelerate global warming. So we have to think carefully about which sectors to target 
And also we should work hard to reduce the error bars uh, associated with the black carbon forcing. Um, and yeah, our, our, study, our recent studies show that uh, as much as perhaps half of the warming uh, from greenhouse gases has been masked by aeros aerosols so far. So if we were to remove that masking, we could, we could see very dramatic climate change. So that's certainly food for thought, I think. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to all of you who are hanging in there in the, in the snowstorm. Um, yeah, last night, uh, Mark Jacobson presented a compelling picture of how we could uh, eliminate global warming pollutants by transforming our energy system to uh, rely on wind, water, and sun. Uh, and then this morning, Dan Esty uh, really gave a very interesting talk about things that Connecticut is doing at the state level um, to uh, move that agenda forward. Uh, he said some disparaging things about Washington. Um, and, uh, but I want to give a sense that there actually is an opportunity to uh, do some things in Washington that would actually work with the states uh, to move that agenda forward. So, you know, from a theoretical perspective, the problem is too much carbon pollution. Uh, other pollutants as well, and we can talk about that interaction, but if you think about that, well, you know, academic solution is pretty simple. You put a tax on carbon, that will raise the cost of using fossil fuels and make the, those wonderful technologies that uh, Mark Jacobson talked about more cost effective. We'll make that transition, everybody's happy. Um, in practice, it turns out to be rather difficult to uh, get that done politically. We can talk uh, a, a lot in the panel about why that's the case. Um, but uh, I, my view, having spent 20 years in Washington, is it's not going to happen anytime soon. Um, we worked very hard to try to get legislation through in 2008, 2009, or 2009, 2010, and it didn't happen. Um, and so the assumption has been Washington is broken, you can't do anything federally, it's all going to be up to the states, the kinds of things that Dan Esty is doing, and that's very important work. Um, yeah, there's the Clean Air Act, uh, but the conventional wisdom is maybe you can get a little bit of uh, carbon reduction using the Clean Air Act, uh, but it's going to be very expensive and it's not going to make much difference. So we've been looking very carefully at that question and uh, put together a proposal and, and, and an analysis of that proposal which shows that that conventional wisdom is wrong that you can actually get big reductions uh, using the Clean Air Act that are uh, quite cost effective uh, given the way that the, the, the law is written and the opportunities that we have to move to clean energy. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to start with the bottom line. Uh, we're focused here on uh, setting carbon pollution standards for existing power plants. Uh, for any lawyers in the room, there's at least one, it's Section 111D of the Clean Air Act. Um, and of course, power plants are responsible for about 40% of U.S. CO2 emissions, so it's by far the biggest source. Uh, with uh, the standards that, uh, the approach that I'm going to describe, we found that we could get uh, more than 500 million tons of CO2 emission reductions uh, by 2020. That's about twice the reductions that will be achieved from the clean car standards, uh, which was by far the most significant step uh, that uh, President Obama's administration took in their first term. So they set standards that will uh, actually cut the carbon emissions per mile from new vehicles in half by 2025. Uh, quite significant. Um, this, the, the, vehicle, the power plant standards I'm going to describe could do twice as much as that. Um, along with that, uh, you would also reduce significantly other pollutants, so coal pollutants from coal plants, particularly uh, sulfur dioxide, and have uh, significant immediate health benefits. Uh, this is accomplished by driving investments into clean energy. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, what Commissioner Esty was talking about, uh, the economics as well as environmental and energy component, there's an investment in uh, particularly energy efficiency that brings with it uh, substantial job opportunities. 
And uh, all this can be accomplished at a relatively low cost on a national basis. Net, we find $4 billion compared with benefits of 25 to 60 billion, so up to uh, 15 to 1 benefit to cost ratio, and I'll explain more about that as I go forward. Um, so the way this is be accomplished is that EPA is required to s issue an emission guideline document uh, which sets out standards uh, that would apply to existing power plants uh, and some compliance provisions. And then under this section of the Act, it's actually a partnership between the federal government and the state. So states then submit uh, implementation plans uh, about how they would uh, comply with those standards. What we propose to do is uh, take advantage of that federalist structure to set s emission rate standards that are uh, depend on the starting generation mix in each state. So a state that uh, is much more coal dependent in its generation mix in a baseline period, uh, think of North Dakota, which had 100%, essentially 100% of its electricity generated by coal, uh, their emission rate standard would be different from Connecticut, which is mostly natural gas fired um, to start with. Their rates would have to get closer together by 2020, but they wouldn't converge to the same number. So this allows us to uh, take into account these, these different regional differences in energy. Uh, it makes the proposal more fair and hopefully more politically uh, feasible. Once you establish what the state standard is, uh, then it's fuel and technology neutral within the state. So all fossil generators would have to meet that same number. That's possible, uh, obviously coal and gas plants have very different emission rates, so how could they meet the same number? Well, that's where the second key component of our proposal comes in, is a flexible compliance regime that allow, takes a system-wide approach uh, to the fossil generation fleet and includes uh, crediting for energy efficiency and renewable energy measures. Um, we did our analysis assuming that compliance was done on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, but we would also recommend that, that states be encouraged and uh, allowed to opt into a multi-state program so that they could actually trade uh, or average across state lines in, in order to comply. And then the other key piece of the, the flexibility is that the federal uh, template is, or the federal uh, guideline that EPA issues would be a template against which you could measure alternative state programs. So Dan Esty would be able to say, well, you know, Connecticut's in Reggie, we're doing all this energy efficiency, we have this big uh, microgrid program, we're gonna, you know, get every school in Connecticut, this is my, what I push them on, to be solar by uh, 2020. Uh, we, our analysis shows that the emissions in Connecticut would be lower than what they would be if we just applied the federal template. And if he can make that demonstration, then EPA would be able to approve that as a state plan. So they don't have to, follow the same structure um, that would be in, in, in the guideline. So just a little bit more about the, the flexibility. Um, conventionally, we think of the Clean Air Act as um, requiring emission control equipment to be bolted on to uh, existing power plants or other uh, industrial sources. And of course, that, that can uh, achieve some emission reductions if you think about a, a typical coal-fired power plant with an emission rate of, say, 2,100 pounds per megawatt hour, uh, there are things you can do to improve the efficiency of the boiler, uh, add electronic boiler controls and things of that nature. And those are estimated to achieve about a 5%, up to about a 5% reduction in the carbon emission rate from, from that unit. Now, there's other things you could do. You could uh, burn biomass uh, along with coal or natural gas along with coal in those boilers. Uh, you could retrofit with carbon capture uh, equipment to, to capture that CO2 and, and store it in geological formation. Uh, technically feasible, tends to be very expensive. We don't think EPA could justify requiring all coal plants to apply the, those types of measures at this point in time. So if you're stuck with what you can do at individual units, uh, you probably are limited to a, a few percent reduction uh, in emissions uh, as something that EPA could accomplish through its regulation, and that was sort of the conventional wisdom. Well, again, we can't do that much with the Clean Air Act, but it, you don't have to stop there. Uh, under our proposal, um, additional measures uh, would 
be able to count towards compliance. In fact, the, our intent is everything that actually reduces emissions from the power sector should be able to be counted towards compliance with the standard. So um, in addition to improvements at individual units, uh, you can shift dispatch from high emitting coal units to lower emitting natural gas combined cycle units. Uh, at least at the, at the power plant stack, that's about a 50 to 60 percent uh, reduction in the emission rate. Uh, because you're allowed to comply on average across the whole fleet, that would count towards compliance. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have proposed that incremental generation from zero emitting sources, say wind or solar, uh, would be able to earn a credit towards compliance. Now these sources aren't regulated under the Clean Air Act because they're not emitting, but the regulated sources would uh, be able to satisfy part of their requirement by obtaining credits from incremental generation um, from, from these sources. And finally, uh, we propose to do the same thing with energy efficiency. So improvements in energy efficiency that are verified by state agencies. So Dan would basically say, uh, here's the programs that we've implemented to uh, uh, do energy efficiency. We've done this measurement and verification. Here's how many megawatt hours we've saved. Those would get a credit towards compliance in the exact same way that increases in renewable energy. Uh, would. So if you do all that, um, we find uh, that you can get really significant emission reductions. Here's, uh, we, we modeled this using uh, a, a model of the electricity system called the integrated planning model. It's the same model that EPA uses for regulatory analysis. Many utilities use it as well. This is the reference case. The reference case assumes implementation of the mercury and air toxic standards. Um, so that's in both cases. So we're looking just at the effect uh, incrementally of the carbon pollution standards. Um, pretty gradual growth, much slower uh, growth than we saw in the 90s, for example. Um, that's because energy efficiency is already built into the baseline to some extent. Um, we're, we're, our growth in electricity demand is not that high. Also, we are seeing you know, some coal plants retiring, uh, more reliance on natural gas. But nonetheless, the baseline here shows you know, gradual increases in emissions, sort of back to their peak level, of which was in 2005 by, by 2020. Um, with the carbon pollution standards in place, we would be on this trajectory, which gets a 26 percent reduction below 2005 levels by 2020, a 34 percent reduction uh, below, 20, uh, below 2005 by 2025. So that, that difference. Uh, between those two lines is the 560 million tons of carbon reductions in 2020 that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, and because of the flexible compliance, and particularly because of energy efficiency as a very cost-effective way to reduce emissions, um, that can be accomplished at uh, very low cost. We uh, are able to use the model to estimate the total change in uh, the cost of delivering electricity services uh, in the country about $4 billion on an annualized basis in 2020. Uh, and that compares with benefits of uh, 25 to 60 billion. And those benefits have two components. The bottom component in blue are the uh, benefits from reducing, particularly SO2 emissions. Um, those occur basically because energy efficiency, uh, as part of the compliance, energy efficiency is replacing a significant amount of the coal-fired generation that would otherwise occur. And so you get incremental reductions in sulfur uh, and NOx emissions beyond what would be achieved by the mercury and air toxic standards and other pollution standards, which are already assumed in the baseline. That surprised me how big that was, because I kind of assumed that those standards were, were pretty tough and there weren't going to be that many, you know, that much conventional pollution that you would also get out. But it's significant. Um, there's, EPA uses epidemiological models to estimate the uh, avoided mortality associated with that, and you use a statistical uh, sort of value of life uh, kind of measure, and you get this value of 11 to uh, uh, 20, uh, six billion dollars or something like that uh, from the immediate health benefits of those. And then the carbon benefits are, are evaluated based on a social cost of carbon concept. Uh, the low estimate uses the administration's uh, number for that, which is uh, $25 per, per ton of CO2 uh, in 2020. The higher estimate uh, uses a 
value that's recalculated using a lower discount rate that we think is more appropriate for an intergenerational uh, problem like this uh, came out to $59 uh, per ton, and that gives you uh, the, the higher value together uh, a total of $60 billion. So just finish by showing how this uh, positions the U.S. Uh, as a whole. Uh, so now we're looking at total energy-related CO2 emissions. Uh, flat line is 2005 levels. The, the dashed line uh, in 2020 is the 17% reduction target that was both in the uh, legislation that had passed the House in 2009 and also has been endorsed by President Obama. Um, and, and then it continues uh, to uh, towards the 80% reduction by 2050 number. So um, EIA, the uh, annual, the, the energy statistical arm of the Department of Energy every year issues a, a sort of official energy forecast. Uh, this is their, their estimate from 2011. Uh, modest uh, growth, but, you know, getting up above 2005 levels uh, around 2030 or so. Now, a few years back, those projections, like if you looked at their projection from 2005, it would be literally off the chart. So, you know, we've actually made a lot of progress in the sense that the baseline forecast has been coming down and down, but obviously uh, not, nowhere close to the, the kind of reduction tra trajectory we need to be on. Um, so, uh, but each year it gets a little better. This was 2012, um, and that's 2013. Um, so that one was just released in December. Uh, they kind of incorporate new policy once it's finalized, so they don't project anything that's not actually a final regulation, so it's pretty conservative in what's included uh, in calculating those lines. Uh, but this 2013 forecast includes the CAR standards that I mentioned, for example, and includes the effect of the mercury and air toxic standards. Um, but it doesn't include any of the energy efficiency standards that, e that the Department of Energy is sort of planning to do but hasn't yet finalized. Um, but in 2012, they, they did what they called an extended policies case that assumes uh, some of these kind of uh, additional policies that can be reasonably anticipated but aren't yet final. And that gives you that orange line, essentially flat emissions uh, out to 20, uh, 30, uh, 2035. Uh, so that's sort of the best kind of business as usual if we don't have federal standards. What we're looking at is roughly constant emissions of CO2. Um, if we layer on top of that the power plant carbon pollution standards that I just described, we get to this green line which gets you uh, 80 percent of the way to the 2020 target. Um, you go out further in time, it gets more and more difficult. But what I conclude from this is that uh, with power plant standards and other measures that uh, the administration has the authority to do under current law, the 2020 target, 17 percent below uh, 2005 levels, is within reach. And uh, actually, earlier this week, World Resources Institute published an analysis that uh, reached the same conclusion. Uh, their analysis is a little bit more detailed in that they looked at not just CO2, but the full set of greenhouse gases. It's a little more challenging uh, when you do that because the baseline forecast for CO2, as I showed you, is basically constant, but the baseline forecast for HFCs and methane is for significant growth. So you have to compensate for that. But nonetheless, they concluded that with uh, aggressive implementation of existing authority, uh, we can achieve this, uh, th this target. So uh, all, all is not uh, lost in Washington. Um, I'm actually quite optimistic that the Obama administration is going to move in this direction. Uh, the president said uh, far more about climate change in his second inaugural speech than uh, anybody I know expected, certainly more than I expected. Uh, more than any other policy issue. And uh, we'll be listening very, very carefully on Tuesday uh, when we've been told he will say more about climate change in the State of the Union address, including hopefully providing some specifics about uh, what he plans to do about it. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lashoff. Our third speaker is Cliff Davidson, who, as I mentioned, is the Thomas and Colleen Wilmot Professor of Engineering at Syracuse University. 
Uh, he's also an atmospheric scientist, and he holds appointments in both the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department and the Syracuse Center for uh, Center of Excellence in Environmental and Energy Systems. He's also the founding director for the Center uh, for Sustainable Engineering, which is a partnership between Carnegie Mellon, the University of Texas at Austin, Arizona State, Georgia Tech, and Syracuse University. He joined Syracuse in 2010, but prior to that, he served for 33 years on the faculty of Carnegie Mellon in both the departments of uh, civil and environmental engineering and engineering and public policy. Professor Davidson's research covers many topics, so I'm gonna highlight two of them here. His long-term research interest is on environmental transport and fate of atmospheric aerosols, especially trace metals. And he's also currently researching urban redevelopment for sustainability, uh, considering the role of green infrastructure in helping to solve air and water management problems. He received his Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from Carnegie Mellon, and a Master of Science, as well as his PhD in Environmental Engineering Science from Caltech. Thank you very, very much, Bruce, and, and I want to begin by um, thanking uh, Nina um, and Peter for um, the invitation to come and participate on this, uh, on this very exciting panel. Um, so uh, we heard um, this morning, um, first from Dan Esty, uh, of course, um, about what's being done in Connecticut, some very exciting things, uh, and, uh, and then uh, transitioning into this section, um, Trudy, I thought, gave a, a, a really nice background of the, the science associated with um, the, uh, the role of aerosols and um, uh, to, to basically counterpose the um, effect of greenhouse gases. Uh, and then uh, Dan talked about the policy options that, that we have. So what we're now going to do is essentially look at uh, a third category of importance here that actually relates both to policy and to science, um, which involves uh, people's behavior and um, how uh, uh, we can uh, understand how people will behave uh, relative to different policies and relative to what they understand about the science, particularly regarding um, what technologies they will accept and also what they know, what they understand about the different technologies. So, um, we know that there are a lot of societal obstacles to change. We know in particular um, that uh, new technologies have to have attributes other than environmental protection. People in general, of course we're excluding people in this room, uh, but in general, people will will not react um, to uh, knowledge that a behavior change will have a good positive, a major positive effect on the environment. There generally has to be something in it for, for me, is the, uh, the standard um, public attitude, and I think that's um, important to keep in mind. The, the rebound effect uh, is actually quite an important one, and one that has not been um, thought about uh, a whole lot, but in fact, let's say that you insulate your house um, and you have been keeping uh, your, th your winter thermostat on, say, a day like today um, at uh, maybe 65 degrees. So you've been wearing a heavy sweater around the house. Uh, then you decide that you're going to do the environmentally correct thing and you're going to add insulation all around the house. Most people when they, when they take a step forward like that, the next thing that happens is their attitude changes a little and they say, you know, I have really done something good for the environment. I've done my part. I can now live a little more comfortably. So what do they do with their thermostat? Instead of 65, maybe they'll move that up to 68 or 69. So in fact, that is known as the rebound effect. And in some cases, that rebound can offset any gains that were made by the addition of insulation. So this is really a, ma a major obstacle. The drop in the bucket effect. Obviously, it's very easy for people to think, how can I, how can I make a difference? And actually, Dan, I thought, alluded to that issue very nicely with people who say, how, how can we possibly 
confront what's going on in Washington right, right now. That's kind of an example of the drop in the bucket effect. Basically, you've got more powerful interests. You've got an enormous number of people of power and influence. How can we have an effect? Um, if there are sacrifices to be made, others should make the sacrifice. The NIMBY phenomenon, not in my backyard. And of course, all of us are familiar with that. Have any of you heard of the banana effect? Any of you know what the banana effect is? Build absolutely nothing anywhere near anything. <laughs> and that really is an extension of the NIMBY effect. And then lastly, and particularly important, is poor understanding of technologies. And uh, in this most recent study, uh, our group looked at what people understand and what they don't understand about technologies and how that can impact their, their behavior. So in fact, um, I'm going to summarize uh, a few of these. Let's see, there should be half a dozen uh, of these issues um, where we looked at uh, what is the single most effective thing you can do to conserve energy um, asked in a survey um, that, that our group conducted. And here you could see the results. Turning off lights was about 20%. Um, and 20% and of the respondents, that was the single most e effective thing. Well, unfortunately, while turning off the lights is a very nice gesture, it doesn't save very much energy compared to the other things that, that we do. So that's a real problem. Conserve energy in general. That was 15%. Basically, people who were not able to, to identify specific things that, that they could do used that. Driving less, using bicycles, using public trans transit, about 13% of our respondents. Changing the setting on our thermostats, about 6%. Changing lifestyle and do not have children <laughs> is another, another 6%. Uh, unplugging appliances. Again, a nice gesture, but what does it really do? So this is about two-thirds of our respondents, if you add up those numbers, about 66%. And then the other third of the respondents basically chose miscellaneous items, um, maybe uh, one or two percent for, for each of those. So uh, in fact, there isn't a major consensus on what people feel they can do, um, but certainly they're not identifying um, the most important things, um, except perhaps uh, the idea of driving less, using bicycles, using public transit, that's something that, that can have an effect and it's doable. Although we're going to look at how doable it is in, in, a, in a few minutes. Now, one thing to notice here is that all of these things that people suggested are curtailment efforts. They're not efficiency improvement. Well, when you think about it, that's really unfortunate because Efficiency improvement, first of all, can have a bigger effect than curtailment, given what we know about people's curtailment. Um, and, and secondly, unfortunately, these issues in curtailment are not likely to be actually followed through by people. And we'll be looking at that as well. So uh, it, it's interesting, but it's unfortunate that people mention curtailment and they think first of curtailment rather than improving energy efficiency, which is, which is far more effective. And we believe that that's probably because of the lack of understanding of efficiency improvement. So uh, in this particular um, set of questions, what we did is we asked people to identify how much energy is used by different um, appliances and devices around the home. Um, compact fluorescent bulbs, laptop computer, stereo desktop com computer, and so forth. But we also asked them how much energy could be saved by certain switches, changing, for example, from higher wattage bulbs to lower wattage uh, incandescent bulbs, replacing incandescent with compact fluorescence, um, turning up the thermostat in summer, turning down the thermostat in winter, changing the setting on the washing machine and line drying clothes in the summer uh, rather than using a, a dryer. Um, the shape of this curve is, is very important and very revealing because what we see is that the estimates are not too far off 
uh, for low energy um, devices. But when we get to high energy devices that could really make a difference, we find that people in general greatly underestimate the amount of energy that they think they're using. And particularly interesting is to look at how quickly this curve levels off even when you go to um, major energy consumers such as a room air conditioner versus essential air conditioner. So you've got the actual energy used versus the perceived energy and what you see is that the perceived energy is virtually the same. In other words, people think that a central air conditioner in their home may use on the order uh, of 20% uh, more energy than a room air conditioner, when in fact the reality is that it's more than a factor of three, which is the difference, of course, on the, on the x-axis between these two. So it, essentially what this is telling us is that human perception of energy use cannot really encompass the enormous changes in energy when you get up to major appliances. People have difficulty in understanding that some appliances can use an order of magnitude or more energy compared to smaller appliances. Their limit is maybe 30% or 50% increases. It's difficult for them to appreciate more than that. Um, you can see that there's a substantial spread uh, N actually equals 505 for this, this particular curve. So we had a good statistical sample. Um, and this is actually a random sample of, of 50 uh, of, our, of our participants. Um, but in fact, what you see uh, is that basically the shape of the curve is very similar for virtually all of our participants. In other words, pretty much everybody uh, is encumbered by this lack of understanding of the enormous range of energies that you can have. So what can we say from that curve? Well, the perception curve is relatively flat. There's a slight overestimate for low energy appliances, but it's actually pretty close. But there's a large underestimate for high energy appliances, and that's really uh, where it's important. Overall, we're talking about an underestimate of close to a factor of three. So people don't appreciate the uh, amount of energy that their activities and their appliances uh, are responsible for. Okay, so let's talk about a, a different survey. In this case, um, we, we began by looking at uh, what experts have decided are the most efficient actions that people can take to reduce their energy, and we surveyed people about how easy or difficult would it be to make those changes. Um, so uh, if we look at the, um, the various um, effective actions that were identified in this study, this is Gardner and Stern, um, we're talking about first some fairly low ones, replacing 100 watt light bulbs with 275 watt light bulbs, uh, replacing incandescent bulbs, decreasing the home thermostat in winter, increasing the air conditioner thermostat in summer, increase the thermostat in your refrigerator and in your freezer, decreasing the washing machine temperature, following car tune-ups at prescribed intervals, reducing highway speed, the maximum highway speed from 70 to 60, reducing the use of your TV set by 25%, and replacing poorly insulated windows with highly insulated windows. Okay, those are the first 10, but in fact, there are five more, and if we look at those, carpool to work, replacing uh, a non-energy star washer with an energy star washer, replacing a, um, an existing inefficient home furnace with a high efficiency furnace, replacing a 20 mile per gallon car with a more efficient car, drying clothing on a clothesline instead of using a dryer. So some of these were repeats for what we also asked people to estimate the energy use for. But now we're asking them a different question, which is how difficult would it be for you to, to make these changes? So what did, what did we find? Okay, so here uh, is a summary of the results. And what we find uh, is, in general, a very poor understanding of how easy or how difficult it will be for people to change their behavior. In other words, we're asking the question, are people realistic 
about how hard or how easy it is for them to make changes. So we, oops, let me go back. So we've got the percentage of the total energy saved by these different activities on the y-axis versus how easy or hard it will be. And this is a seven-point scale uh, that has been uh, adopted um, by uh, social beha and behavioral scientists. Um, basically going from extremely easy, very easy, somewhat easy, over to, F, this is the neutral position, neither easy nor hard, somewhat hard, very hard, and extremely hard. And these words were chosen based on what behavioral scientists uh, have found will uh, basically trigger the, the proper thoughts in people um, for uh, their perceptions about changing behavior. Um, so what we see is, first of all, uh, all of these 15 behaviors of Gardner and Stern, all of them are to the left of neither easy nor hard, which means that across the board, all of these behaviors were viewed to be easy. They were viewed to be easy. Now, some of them were viewed to be less easy than others, but all of them were viewed to be easy. And in particular, uh, let me point out that um, the two that seem to be closest to that neutral line are carpooling and purchasing a more efficient car. We know that purchasing a more efficient car is a big step and involves shelling out money. Um, it's always a big step when people buy a car and to make a decision based on the energy efficiency uh, is something um, that with current gasoline prices uh, we know that gasoline prices have not been high enough to greatly affect people's choice. And that's why, in fact, we still have a fairly high um, uh, percentage of cars on the road that are SUVs and uh, high uh, gasoline usage vehicles. Um, we also know that carpooling is not very popular. We know it's very difficult um, for people to... Uh, um, make the decision to team up with another family. And of course we heard from Dan Esty this morning um, about what segment of the population we're talking about here. Um, so mothers who have to pick up their kids, um, drive their kids to soccer games and so forth, um, it's gonna be very difficult for them to time those activities with others. So we know carpooling is tough. Um, but in any case, the, the net result here is that people do not have a good understanding of how difficult it is uh, for them to, to change their own behavior. That's, this is what we, what we learned from this survey. Okay, even if we were to educate people as to the actual energy consumption of their choices, and even if they wanted to reduce consumption, it still wouldn't be easy to change. Behavior change, in fact, is extremely difficult. And, um, for, for my last couple of slides, I'm, I'm going to uh, now talk a little bit um, about some studies of changing people's behavior. This has been most studied for addictive behavior, but in fact, behavioral scientists have come up with some very interesting results that have shown that the same reasons for people having difficulty in changing chemically addictive behaviors are also reflected in the difficulty that people have in changing long-standing habits, which is very revealing because all of us can appreciate how difficult it is for um, a drug addict, say, to be removed from drugs and an alcoholic to be removed from, from alcohol. So uh, this is, this is a, a, a very revealing finding, actually. Uh, and I'll refer to the work of Prochaska uh, which is actually, this is very interesting because recently I learned from uh, a physician's organization that the Prochaska paper is now required reading for medical doctors in medical school as, as they're going through school. So this is something that is, is obviously realized as being extremely important. And this has become a classic paper even though it's, it's not tremendously old. There's the pre-contemplation stage. People are unaware of their problems, no intent to change. Then there's contemplation, 
which is at least people become aware of their problem, but they're not ready yet. Then there's preparation. This is when people say, okay, I'm going to do something about my problem within the next month. Then there's action, and then there's maintenance, which is constant, and that is work to prevent uh, a relapse. And the way that Prochaska modeled this uh, is actually as a spiral diagram, where you start off with pre-contemplation, you work your way up to contemplation, preparation, then you take action, but in fact the problem is that unless you have been successful for at least six months in this loop, you are likely to relapse. When you relapse, you don't fall all the way back to pre-contemplation. You may only fall back to preparation, you may fall back to contemplation, but you're going to be able to work your way back up a little bit easier. But in fact, the goal is to get up to the maintenance stage, and a lot of people have difficulty with the idea that this maintenance is something that's going to take an effort for the rest of their life. So knowing that these stages can also be applied to people's long-standing behaviors, including things like driving their car to work, is something that can um, inform us on how difficult it might be for, um, uh, for people, even the most well-intentioned people, to change their, their behavior. So, conclusions from, from just these, uh, this small subset of studies uh, are, first of all, people's thoughts about energy conservation are mainly curtailment rather than improving efficiency, when in fact uh, imp improving efficiency can actually buy us more energy savings, and it's going to be a, co a, a combination of uh, improvement in efficiency and curtailment. Public understanding of energy use day-to-day -day of day-to-day -day, uh, activities is really poor, and we've seen that. Uh, we've also um, looked at uh, the. I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with the NEPS scale, uh, the National Ecological Paradigm scale, but one can use that um, scale that's been tested with tens of thousands of people to determine an individual's environmental attitudes. And so we tested all of our subjects with the NEPS scale, and so we know what what correlations exist and what correlations don't exist in terms of environmental attitudes. Um, and then thirdly, people believe that change is easier than it really is and that leads to overly optimistic predictions and it, it really gives us an idea of the challenges that, that we face and, and that we need to be aware of. So with that, I will stop. Okay, so I think we just had three really good presentations covering kind of a full range of issues, starting first with some of the issues in the sort of climate science and atmospheric measurement modeling, moving on to some policy, and then issues of behavioral science. I think we have maybe about half an hour, and what I want to do is just sort of open it up to your questions if you want to ask any of the individual speakers or if you have broader questions of the panel. Um, we do have a microphone, so if you could wait just until you get it. But does anyone have a question? Guess I'll start off. Uh, I had a question for Dan. Um, uh, to me, you know, the curve that you presented in terms of the potential um, emissions reductions from the the. Well, I don't want to call it a cap and trade, but that's how I'm thinking about it. Um, potential program uh, is very striking, and and uh, we're also hearing that you know there's some momentum uh, in Washington. Perhaps perhaps there's some signaling going on from the White House about you know, being more open or, or pushing something forward. I'm, I'm just wondering if you could say a few words about how you see, how you see that unfolding. If, if what we're seeing is proper signaling, then, then how does this turn into the full implementation of the plan over how many years and what does it look like right. in general? Uh, yeah, so um, it's, uh, I, I'm optimistic, but that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Um, the, the sort of regulatory schedule that we have uh, kind of sketched out and I think is po possible um, is starting Tuesday, the president gives some kind of clear signal that he wants EPA to move forward. Um, that's, a, that's important because um, 
th this is challenging and without White House support, even though EPA has a legal obligation to actually do this, that doesn't mean they would do it. Um, so it's going to be critical to have that, that White House support. Uh, EPA has indicated that they, what they would actually do before they proposed a, uh, a program, a standard for existing power plants, they want to have a process of engaging states so they get input and try to get some buy-in from some, at least some uh, key states. So that would be the next thing we would see. That may take three or four months. Um, sometime in maybe the third quarter of 2013, EPA would propose a standard. That standard then uh, legally is required to be uh, available for public comment. That, that's typically a 90-day period where anybody can say anything they want about it. Typically, that will be, you know, a mostly utilities and some environmental groups providing technical comments about how it could be strengthened or weakened or why it's a bad idea. Um, last time when EPA proposed a – they did propose they – they do have a proposal standard for new power plants, which was issued last year, um, and the environmental community actually mobilized public support to demonstrate that there's a real desire to have EPA move forward, and, and over 3 million public comments were submitted in, in favor of EPA finalizing that standard, which is m far more than EPA has ever received on any previous rulemaking. So um, we, would, uh, we would probably engage in, in that type of mobilization again, uh, in addition to providing public comments, uh, more technical comments. So that process takes about a year. Uh, between proposal and final rule. So we'd expect a final rule to be issued in uh, towards the end of 2014, probably after the midterm election. Um, uh, and, then, uh, and then states would be given probably about a year to submit implementation plans. Um, so we don't actually, you know, the first date in which companies would be legally required to meet this kind of standard is probably not till 2018, maybe not even until 2020. But once the process starts, I think one of the important things to keep in mind is that it, it, it will actually have an impact right away. In fact, the possibility of this happening is already, I think, having an impact on investment decisions. Over the next three years, uh, power plant owners have to decide, if you own a coal plant, if it doesn't already have the full set of uh, emission controls on it, uh, it will by 2015, 2016 need to uh, be retrofit to comply with the mercury standards. Um, that's a big investment to make. Um, knowing that EPA has the ability to, to set this as well, uh, we think will actually start to influence those decisions and more more people will say, you know, that's probably not a good investment to try to keep this coal plant running for the next 30 years because we need to move to cleaner options. Could you, uh, Mike. Oh. So what's the cost, though, if, if they were to choose, let's say, to go with, to convert to a sort of methane plant, you know, is, that's the other, would be the other option of an existing coal plant, right? Wouldn't they be able to easily move into that, that resource? Yeah, so uh, it, it depends um, on a lot of things. Our analysis actually showed that the main uh, and cheapest compliance option would be to uh, have energy efficiency programs that, that reduce demand and that um, that reduction in demand would essentially reduce the, the need for generation from the coal plants. And natural gas there would be some growth in generation from natural gas, but kind of at the business as usual rate. Um, so it ends up shifting the mix towards more gas, but mostly by having energy efficiency and renewables replace coal. Um, you know, it, it all depends on, and I should say that those types of programs are designed to kind of overcome these behavioral barriers. That, you know, the, the programs that are effective are ones that actually give people, say, rebates so that they buy more efficient equipment rather than, say, just you know, send you a note that says, please turn down your thermostat. Those, <laughs> those don't work for the reasons that we just heard. But programs where you, you know, buy a, uh, a SEER 15 uh, air conditioner instead of a SEER 12 and you'll get a $100 rebate, those, those programs actually work. So, um, uh, so those kinds of things. Um, but it just like the coal versus gas, uh, if you're looking at two plants that are both exist. So one question is, you know, do you have to need, build a new plant or not? 
Um, right now, there's actually quite a bit of spare capacity, um, uh, and in particular, a lot of natural gas plants that are not operated at full capacity. Uh, with gas prices where they've been over the last year, it's pretty much a wash. I mean, it's about three cents a kilowatt hour to generate with either uh, coal or gas. Gas prices go up, you know, there, there'll be a, a, some margin there. Um, if you have to build a new plant, that's a totally different story. May I ask a question? I had a question for Cliff. I, I thought it was interesting that people have such um, unrealistic uh, ideas about how easy it would be to make changes. But I wondered if you asked them instead about their willingness instead of how easy they thought it would be, uh, would you have gotten different responses? Or? Uh, th thank you for, for that question, Trudy. Th this is really um, a, a current debate, uh, I guess, um, among uh, the um, social behavioral scientists uh, on how you survey people. Um, there is one uh, type of survey, the willingness to pay survey, that does target exactly people's willingness uh, to pay a particular amount. And um, the, the results of those surveys suggest that uh, a person's will, how a person answers a survey like that is somewhat different than how much they actually shell out when it comes time to pull out their wallet. <laughs> Um, and so I, I'm, I'm not real optimistic uh, that if you ask the, the, the question that way that there would be, um, that it would reflect more of the truth, which is of course what we're, what we're really af after here. Um, the, the, the results conceivably um, could be somewhat, somewhat different, um, but whether it really reflects what people what people's actions would be is another another question entirely. Cliff, isn't one of the reasons for that that people are um, very aware of how they might perceive be perceived when they're taking the survey, and so they want to be seen as somebody who thinks that it's easy or who is very willing? Y yes, actually, Peter, that that that's right. And for that purpose, all of these surveys um, are are done you know, with uh, anonymous coding and um, we're, what we're trying to do, of course, is to dispel any concern that people might have that they would be identified with their response. I wonder, just jumping off of that, if you've taken a look at a revealed preference framework. So in economics, there's been this debate about uh, willingness to pay for a variety of different, you know, environmental amenities and services for a long time. and. And where a lot of people come down is really what we need to do is try and figure out ways instead of serving people of actually measuring their behavior, you know, what they do do, and then potentially um, compare that that with what they say they're going to do to to understand uh, what's sort of likely. Uh, is that something that you guys feel like you can look at or are thinking about? Um, we we certainly have thought a lot about it, uh, and uh, a lot of times this entails doing things like. Um, like getting access to a uh, person's energy bills and looking, looking at um, their, uh, their energy consumption month to month and, and so forth. Uh, so yes, we're, uh, we're looking into those kinds of studies. Um, conducting that, those kinds of studies uh, is really a totally different regime than conducting the surveys. Uh, but in fact, I agree with you. That that's the kind of information that, that we really would like to have. I think there is a question over here. Um, this is going back to Trudy's presentation. Um, I'm wondering what you see as the next steps in reducing the uncertainties related to aerosols. Are there specific on the ground or, I mean, remote sensing measurements we need, or is most of this going to happen in the modeling world, do you think? Um, thanks for the question. Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, as the, the study that just came out uh, on black carbon showed, uh, remote sensing and monitoring is really important to actually keep track of what emissions are in different parts of the world. And that's, you know, what we're feeding into our models. Uh, so that's, that's crucial, clearly. So that's, first step will, is to, to know what emissions are and how they're changing, and especially some regions where they're changing rapidly. But then there's also the issue of, you know, 
uh, in modeling that we don't really understand a lot of mechanisms in the atmosphere very well when it comes to, for example, black carbon and how it affects clouds. And that's, that is potentially a major contributor to the net forcing. So I think we have to work hard on many fronts. And I wish that we had time to really nail down all these things, especially from the modeling side, before we acted. But clearly, that's not an option. We have to live with those uncertainties and make decisions uh, even with them. So um, yeah, we have to, to work on many fronts at the same time and, and also accept making decisions under uncertainty. So on that point, Dan, I wonder, as someone who works on climate and clean air policy, how do you view the, the potential conflict between carbon policies and policies that might reduce these other pollutants? Yeah, I, you know, it's an interesting question. I actually don't see it as a, a conflict in practice. I, I just think we, you know, I, I look at it pretty simply. I think less pollution is better, and uh, if you want less carbon pollution, you have to regulate carbon pollution. I mean, you know, sorry, using language that we use for public engagement purposes so people don't understand what greenhouse gases are, so we talk about carbon pollution now. And it's interesting because we spent years distinguishing greenhouse gases from other type of pollutants, and we concluded that was completely nuts from a public uh, perception point of view. It's like, you know, people generally think less pollution is better than more pollution, so let's just work with that. Uh, anyway, so if you want less CO2, you regulate CO2. If you want less sulfate because fine particles kill people, you regulate sulfate. Um, there are some co-benefits and co-interactions, but ultimately, you know, we really just need to push as hard as we can on all these fronts. And uh, uh, so I think it's, it's, it's been interesting to watch the attention to black carbon and my reaction to it has been, at least in the U.S., where we've been regulating par particulates, uh, diesel particulates, very strictly, quite frank, and, and, and we've started to crack down on, on sulfur emissions from power plants. It's like, well, viewing it as a climate forcer, does it cause you to do anything different than what you're already doing uh, in the air pollution regime? And I think the answer is no. Now, that's, that's probably a different answer if you think about biomass burning or some other, other sources. But I, yeah, I'd be interested in your reaction. Yeah, um, uh, I think... Um if, if you think about air quality in isolation and, and you don't keep in mind what the climate effects could be, you could get some very unpleasant surprises, actually. Uh, so you have to be very well aware, for example, with sulfur, that if you, you're reducing it for air quality purposes, that you may uh, accelerate warming uh, as, as a, a consequence. And, and actually, I was very inspired by Mark Jacobson's talk yesterday, but I thought about it afterwards, and I think you know, if we could in fact transition to all this renewable energy, the, the immediate effect on climate would actually be a warming because you are removing these short-lived aerosol species from the atmosphere. The long term uh, is clear, it's a benefit to climate as well, but we may actually see a very accelerated warming if we were at all possible to, uh, or able to um, transition to the, the, these renewable fuels. So that's, we have to at least brace for that or be prepared for that. If, if we were to transition. So yeah, I mean, I agree that we need to be aware of it, but, uh, and I think, well, what is the implication of that? Well, if you have an opportunity to um, have a pollution standard that's gonna save 10,000 lives a year because we're reducing particle pollution, am I gonna say don't do that because it might accelerate warming in the short term? No, I'm gonna say, well, we gotta do that, and we gotta also simultaneously do everything we can to reduce carbon uh, CO2 emissions. Uh, and methane emissions, so that we're trying to address the the, the, the longer term forcing at the same time. I, I, in practice, I still don't quite know what I do differently. Being aware that there may be this sort of unmasking effect. So I, I just wanted to to mention that, um, of course, in in Europe, uh, more than half of their uh, personal automobiles are operated with diesel, um, but. Uh, they have they have succeeded in um, using uh, new diesel technology, which is which is fairly clean. And so, you know, one could argue that that in Europe they have um, some benefits of reduced air qual or reduced uh, air pollution, um, but also uh, higher energy efficiency that you can that you can get with mm -hmm. diesel. And I'm just I'm just wondering if that's 
uh, something that um, that you've considered, Dan? Or? Well, it's interesting. I mean, the U.S. market uh, it doesn't seem to be going towards diesel. The efficiency standards that I mentioned will uh, continue to boost the, the fuel economy of the fleet, but so far, uh, and, and diesel would be an option that automakers have, but it's actually pretty relatively expensive. Diesel engines are more expensive to build than gasoline engines. So we're mostly seeing other types of technological improvements, hybridization um, in, in various forms, sort of mild hybrids where you just have a little bit of battery and you, you shut the engine off automatically when you come to a stop, um, gives you a little bit of boost, allows you to downsize the, the, the uh, engine block a little bit without sacrificing perception of, uh, you know, pickup and power uh, is one thing that, that's certainly happening. Vehicles are becoming lighter as people start using more aluminum and carbon fiber materials. Um, I think in the long run, you know, you do get a, probably 15% something like 15 to 20 percent benefit from a diesel engine versus a gasoline engine, that's not going to get us where we need to be. Um, so you do need to move to um, either uh, electric vehicles or sustainable biofuel uh, vehicles in, in order to. So I, and I think, I think that's more the direction the U.S. market's uh, tending towards now. So I, I, I doubt we'll see a big upsurge in diesel in the U.S. Part of the, part of the push in Europe it has been a result of, uh, of somewhat, I mean, of, of very different tax treatment. So in Europe, the, the truckers, you know, it's, it's not like their politics are free of lobbying either. The truckers were successful in keeping the tax rate on diesel fuel much lower than the tax rate on gasoline. They're, they're, they're still both much higher than they are in the U.S., but, but that made it very attractive for consumers then to have diesel vehicles, um, and we don't have that differential tax treatment here, so. Other questions? I, I have yeah, one. Sure. Or it's not a question. It's more of a <laughs> follow-up. Um, so I, I have to agree with you, Dan, that, um, of course, from an air quality uh, perspective, you want to reduce uh, aerosol con concentrations across the board, uh, perhaps independent of, of climate. But I also um, want to remind you that, um, well, Mark Jacobson brought up Arctic sea ice uh, yesterday, and, and that, you know, we're, we're, we may see it disappear over the next uh, 10 to 20 years, and really uh, the, the short-term um, climate forces could really make a difference in, in this context. And you know, it's also a question of weighing lives lost due to air quality and lives lost to, to climate change, although it's harder to measure lives lost um, as a response to climate change. But uh, it may not be as clear cut once you factor in all, the, all these things. And also, I want to remind everyone that people are thinking about geoengineering, where actually you purposely put more sulfur in the atmosphere to uh, counter global warming. So, so while we're, we're sitting here saying that it's a no-brainer that we should reduce also sulfur, independent of its climate effect, other people are thinking about putting more sulfur in the atmosphere to combat uh, global warming. So just yeah. to remind everyone of that. No, it's, um, it's, I, I, I've probably been a little too glib about it. I, I, you know, if, I think it does make sense to try to concentrate it, it, particularly if there are sources where the black carbon dominates over the other aerosols, to see what you can do to, to put a particular focus on those. That, that certainly helps in the short run. Um, focusing on reducing methane, which is sort of intermediate, it's usually called a short-term climate forcer, but really is an intermediate term climate forcer, is something where we could get a relatively quick response. So we definitely should be doing that as well. Um, you know, putting sulfur in the in this stratosphere. So, so people are talking about putting sulfur. They're not saying put it into the air that people breathe, right? They are saying put it in the stratosphere, generally. Um, it will uh, come down. But yes. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, but but there may you know that uh, all kinds of complications with that, such as what what effect it has on the ozone layer and things of that nature. I guess the one area where you maybe uh, I would say we ought to think twice about my general mantra that less pollution is better. Um, is in um, in shipping, so international shipping. They tend to use the worst, the highest sulfur bunker fuels, and 
uh, there is a movement as those ships come into port to require them to switch over to cleaner fuels to reduce the uh, health effects in, in, uh, in port cities. But maybe that's an area where you say, well, if you're out in the open ocean, uh, burn that high sulfur fuel, <laughs> let that sulfur go in the atmosphere, maybe we get a little bit of a climate benefit from that one. <laughs> Still a lot for sure. I, I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has one. Angel. Yes, um, so the first YCI student symposium we had was actually about black carbon, and it seemed like then there was a lot of discussion in the policy sphere and in the media about regulating black carbon for the short-term climate benefits. But it seems like four or five years later, there's not that much of the policy discussion around reduction of black carbon. So this question is for Trudy and Dan. I mean, for Trudy, is it really necessary or should we still be thinking about black carbon reductions from a policy perspective? And Dan, is there any of that type of discussion happening in Washington or has that phase already passed and we're now looking down the line at something else? Um, yeah, so um, in, in terms of the, uh, for, for black carbon, you, you saw that there is a very active research going on and, and you know, nailing down what the actual climate force forcing is from black carbon. And I think you know, just from judging from the, the attention that the study got uh, that just came out, uh, I think people are still thinking about black carbon and I, I, again, I think it's a no-brainer to try to reduce black carbon from an air quality perspective. And as long as we could at least show that it, it's not going to harm climate, I think that would help uh, policy. Um, like I said, unfortunately, we have to live with these large uncertainty ranges. Uh, and I don't see that we're going to reduce them within you know, the, the next decade or so. And we probably have to make some decisions before, before that. So. Um, there's active research, and I think you know there's research to inform policy. But but there are certain uh, uncertainties that we can't uh, get rid of right now. The public just loves scientific uncertainty <laughs> in the U.S., right? <laughs> they don't want to hear about it. No, they, <laughs> they don't want to know. <laughs> but, but there is actually active policy discussion. I mean, one of the international negotiations on on climate are pretty bogged down. But one of the initiatives last year um, was a initiative on short-term climate forcers um, that Secretary Clinton kind of elevated. It's not a huge amount of money behind it, but it is sort of put a little bit of a spotlight on that. Um, those, I, I think more generally, um, there is quite a bit of discussion about the, you know, let's not just talk about carbon dioxide. Um, we have to deal with methane, HFCs, um, some of which are relatively short-lived, high, high GWP um, gases and and black carbon. Um, a lot of a lot of the black carbon is, is you know. I think the challenge is what what do you actually do then, and and is it effective? So, you know, improve cook stoves is one area where you might do something, um, and you know, but what will that do to? Is it again? What's the ratio of black carbon to organic carbon as you reduce those emissions? Behavioral change, talk about a real challenge. People have cooked traditionally in one way for, you know, generations and generations. Not, not, not at all easy. I think there's a lot of kind of loose thinking that that would be just simple. You just give people good cook stoves if something gets tried every once in a while and people abandon it because it didn't do anything. Then <laughs> 10 years later they come back and say, let's do a cook stove initiative. <laughs> um, so we have to think pretty carefully about that. Uh, the one area that we're active in, which I do think is promising, again, I'm not sure exactly what the net climate benefits will be, but the public health benefits will be really big, uh, is to try to get uh, a, basically a global phase out, not quite out, but a, a global phase down of sulfur in diesel fuel. Um, so we did this a few years ago with lead. Now basically there's no lead in, diesel, in, in gasoline anywhere in the world except maybe North Korea and some other rogue country, but it's pretty much gone. And of course that enables a bunch of other pollution control technologies. Same thing with low sulfur diesel. It enables particulate controls on, on diesel engines. Um, and you know, if, if all you do is just take the sulfur out, then you're clearly gonna have a warming effect from that, although there'll be health benefits. But if you then use that to enable much tighter particulate controls uh, on diesel emissions, which is something the U.S. has done, Europe has done, but is not widespread throughout the rest of the world. Um, 
then uh, I guess hopefully it's about a wash on climate and you've got very substantial public health benefits. All right. Well, thank you so much, Cliff, Trudy, and Dan. Uh, excellent panel, and, and thank you for sharing your research with us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Um, and with that, we'll wrap up our panel events for the day, uh, given the snow. Um, we'll have, we'll have uh, some brief closing remarks from our director um, of the Yale Climate and Energy Institute, um, Professor Mark Pagani, and then we'll move forward to lunch. Yes. It's snowing. In fact, I think you know our climate models have lots of uncertainty, but a really good predictor of extreme weather is uh, YCI symposiums, because <laughs> this is the second one that was screwed up by, the first one was you know, Hurricane Sandy. You know, we had to postpone that until January. And now we're on our second one with the next blizzard. So I think it's a good predictor. You want to put it on your calendars. Next time you see something we're doing, you may want to stay home. Uh, so OK, first of all, I want to thank all our speakers and guests, that they were very, you know, just great talks. And I also want to thank uh, the, the student organizers, Danina Haspotsky, Natalie Schultz, Candace Harper, Angel Sue, and Peter Christensen, too, you know, who, who worked tirelessly to build this. This is the fourth event, and, uh, and I, I'm always impressed by, by, uh, by the outcome, at least the outcome in, the, in, the, in terms of intellectual content. And, uh, and, I'll, and I'll just say one, a couple of words, just from my own perspective, because, uh, you know, why not? You know, I have one more. There's always another perspective on climate. When you're thinking about climate and you're thinking about all these things, obviously there's a, a, you know, a brilliant array of problems and, and questions, right? And depending on your focus, that's where you tend to sit and think about that particular focus. Hearing these, you know, this debate in this last uh, few comments, this idea of, of human health and pollution. And you know, for me, I, just to let you know, from my perspective, it, it's only about heat. And I have, I have zero concern almost about anything else anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's the simplest way for me to, to reduce the problem. The heat is the climate system, and that affects everything else. And you know, every, everything else is going to follow from the heat and heat distribution. And that's greenhouse gases. And, uh, no matter what we do with greenhouse gases, whether they're short-term effects or long-term effects like CO2, which, by the way, has a residence time of thousands to ten thousands, really, actually hundreds of thousands of years. You know, this is not a simple problem. The heat, you know, the heat generated by these gases, eventually all, it all goes into the ocean. And when you extract the uh, greenhouse gases, if you were to spend the money and you had the commitment and the backbone, that heat then is pumped out of the ocean. And the, the few studies that have looked at this sort of uh, relationship between heat generated and, it, and then uh, sequestered into the ocean and then released is that there's a balance, meaning that there's, even if you were to wait, if you were to wait 50 or 60 or 70 years before you accomplished the, uh, a solution where you reduced uh, the CO2, you would then have a heat source from the ocean that would be equivalent to the greenhouse forcing for hundreds of years. So the, there's actually, you know, there's urgency to the problem because, the, you know, heat is, is being inputted into the ocean and will be released. So that, once you have that, you know, problem, then it's all about geoengineering. In fact, it's all about geoengineering in many ways before you can get started on the solution, which is one of these fantastical problems where this is what the last uh, few conversations were about, sulfate, and increasing the albedo of the earth in order to keep the heat away from the surfaces of the earth. It's a, it's, even though it sounds like sci science fiction, it's, a, it's, it's part of the solution. And uh, so I just want to leave you with that thought that there is actually urgency here. And, uh, and uh, I, I, I'm learning every time uh, we have one of these meetings. And, uh, I, and, just, and yesterday, with uh, Jacobson's talk, my whole, my whole perspective on renewable fuels that was altered. So anyway, I just want to leave you with that and thank our guests. There's sushi from Mia's upstairs. For those who have come, we, we will reward you with, uh, with uh, food and drink upstairs. So please join us for lunch. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>